We're going to go about seven minutes, fellas. Turn the topsoil and let's get on it, all right? Psalm 56, we're going to read first verse number three. It says, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Oh, yeah. Then look down to verse number 11. It says, In God have I put my trust, I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Amen. What I want to preach on tonight is just this simple thought, if I can get that out. Why are we afraid? Why are we afraid? And I got four things just real quick. First thing is why are we afraid of man over the Father? Yeah. I'll tell you a little, just a little small story, quick story. That's why I decided to cut out my introduction. God kind of laid this on my heart back there. For any of you who may not know me, uh, me and Sister Tina, we came here to be 21 years ago, I believe, in the month of June. Uh, we came here, I sat here under Brother Doug's preaching for years. Um, I surrendered to preach, I would teach the kids, I would do a lot of things and leave out of here in most all services, God telling me I was lost and I was going to die and go to hell. And then roughly right around 2011, I decided that the best thing to do was just to run completely away from God and go to Indiana. The um, thing about it is you can't get away from God. God spoke to my heart up there, uh, settled in him in my heart, got saved, and a little bit after that, God began to deal with me about preaching his word again. Now, I remember going, Brother Phil, to Brother Doug and talking about who's going to believe me. And he laid that verse on my heart in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Yeah. Why are we so concerned and so afraid of man over having a reverent fear for the Father? Yeah. Uh, we'll go through life and we, we seem to not care that if God tells us we're supposed to be in church... Doesn't matter, we'll just come when we want to. God tells us we're supposed to read the Bible. We'll read it when we get around to it. God tells us we're supposed to pray. We'll pray when we have time. We have no reverent fear for the Father, but we're scared to death about what somebody else might think about us. We're too worried about if we're wearing the right thing, got the right clothes on, say the right words, whatever it may be. Why are we afraid of man over the Father? The second thing is why are we afraid of worship over work? Every single one of us will go in on a job, and by all, by all means, we should do this. We will give 110%. We will give of ourselves of whatever our boss asks of us. We'll go in and we'll try our best. We'll do our best because we want to earn our paycheck. And then we'll come in here to service, and we'll sit down. And I know that's not what this song means, but we might as well sit down our hands. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Because we ain't about to worship. We're not about to raise our hand. We're not about to let tears fall. We're not allowed about to let anything happen that might make us look maybe a little bit odd. We think we don't want to act like Brother Phil. You know, I remember in that old building, Brother Charlie used to get up, and I remember him one time going out that side door and running around the building. Where's our worship at? Those kids came up here and sang, and I was sitting back here thinking, we ought to shout this place out tonight, and none of us should get to preach with how good God's been to every one of us. Why are we too concerned? Why are we more afraid of worship over work? Are we afraid that if we worship, it might get on a little bit? Are we afraid that if we was to worship this morning, uh, if it was allowed to get on during Sunday school, that maybe we wouldn't make it to the restaurant by 12.30 or 1 o'clock? Was we afraid we might end up being here a little later? Heaven forbid are we get, get on and pastor announce, hey, we're just going to have a revival meeting leading up to camp meeting because that's going to take too much time. I'd love it. I, I'm much, look, I, I am looking forward to going out. Tomorrow night is going to be the first night in almost over a month that will hopefully have everybody together again to go out on visitation. I'm looking forward to it, Brother Phil. I'd rather be in church. I'd rather God just break out revival and us just be right here and let people drive by, uh, have that pool to come. Why are we more afraid of worship over work? Why are we more scared of the truth over lies? I almost grabbed his water. We are super quick and super fast to go tell somebody, hey, hey, Brother Christian, let me, let me tell you what I heard today. Now, I don't know if it's true, but this is what I heard. When was the last time we walked up and said, let me tell you what happened at church yesterday, Brother Ray. Let me tell you about how good the, kid, uh, the kids went to camp. Let me tell you about how good a camp meeting they had. Let me tell you about how good it was last night during tag team. Why are we more afraid to share the truth over lies? And the last thing, I don't know how much time I have left. Why are we more afraid of holiness over sinfulness? We have no problem just tiptoeing into sin. We have no problem just seeing how far we can go and maybe before God says something to us. Why don't we do the same thing when it comes just trying to be holy before God? I'm afraid that we've convinced ourselves that in order to be holy, you have to be the pastor. You have to be somebody that, that is in the ministry, so to speak. 
That's not what being holiness is about. If we are going to be completely sold out to God, each and every one of us in this room can be holy before God. But we seem to be scared of that. Well, if I'm going to be completely sold out to God, I might want to come to church all week like Brother Josh just talked about. And I wouldn't want to do that. Then I have to tell everybody at work that I get to go to church all week, and then I'm going to be afraid of what they're going to think about me. And it's a never-ending battle with fear of the world over a reverent fear of God. Why are we more afraid of being holy over being sinful? Well, so much tiptoe around in the world, seeing what we can get by with, and not being completely sold out to God. It's hard telling what our pastor says, Brother Doug says it all the time. The world has yet to see one church completely sold out to him and what we could do. Why can't we be that church? Why can't we be that church? I'm done, Brother Carter. John chapter 8, please. In John chapter 8, we got Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came unto the people again, unto the the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and he taught them verse 3 and the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery and when they had set her in the midst he said unto them master this woman has taken in adultery in the very act now Moses in the law commanded us that we should that such should be stoned but what sayest thou and they said unto, and they said, tempting him that they might have accused him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote in the ground, as though he heard them not. Bless the Lord. And when they had continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin, sin among you, sin among you, let him first cast the stone at her. And again they stooped down and wrote in the ground. And when and they which heard it being convicted in their conscience went out one by one beginning from the eldest unto the last and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst and when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman and unto her woman where are those thy accusers hath no man condemned thee and in verse 11 and she said no man Lord and Jesus said Neither do I, uh, and neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. This is a, just a brief background setting of this. Jesus is in the Mount of Olives. More than likely, he didn't have a place to go. He didn't have a place to stay. So what he done was, he stayed there. But the whole context of this whole situation with this woman, the sinning woman, the scribes and the Pharisees, they had one thing up their sleeve. They want to embarrass Jesus. There's a crowd taking place there. You had all different types of people there. The main thing they wanted to do was, oh, we want to get Jesus. They had nothing good to say about Jesus. In verse number one, it talks about, oh, I'm going to go, sorry, verse two. Jesus, in verse two, and early in the morning, he came up to the people in the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down, and he taught them. Jesus remained in Jerusalem after the Feast of the Tabernacles. The religious authorities wanted, like I said, they wanted to silence and arrest him. He went boldly and taught the large crowds, but most of the people in place in Jerusalem. Now, in verse 3, it talks about the Pharisees and the scribes. What we got here is they wanted to embarrass Jesus. That's how a lot of people are nowadays. They want to get you out right in the middle, say, hey, look at the uh, Christian guy over there. I've had it happen to me. I don't care. They want to embarrass me. They can't because I know who my Redeemer is. I don't, I, could, I don't care what they think of me. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought him into a woman, taken in adultery. Now, how did they know where this woman was, that's wonder. Why didn't they bring the other guy? Yeah, right. Yeah, and they had set her in the midst. That's the midst is in the middle. You remember how you used to be in the middle? Sure. You could be in the middle right now and not even realize it. People are looking at you. They don't mean nothing by it. They're just looking at you. But this dear lady, but the one thing I was really impressed with this lady, at the very end, she only said three words. She got any time wanted to when she was in the midst. She could have got up and left. Just like right now, you could get up and leave. But there's something about church and there's something about Jesus. It gets your attention. In verse 4, I'm, I'm just going through it. And we see the accusers tell their story. Okay, and now they said unto him, Master. <laughs> That's a joke. And when they said, I'm getting to it, I got a point behind that. This woman was taken in adultery in the very act. In, verse, in Matthew chapter 27, 
Verse 63, these same Pharisees and scribes, they were calling him a deceiver. Yeah. Now they got enough nerve to call him a master. They're putting on a show. Right. That's all they're doing is putting on a show. Right. We see again, we see in uh, verse 5, we see the scriptures, they're trying to use the scriptures against Jesus. What they're doing is now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? What do you say, Jesus? They want to trip him up. You ain't going to trip him up, man. They, have, they don't have a clue who he is. If they were in Christ, they would know. They'd keep their mouth shut and listen. But no, all they want to do is run their mouth. Okay. They wanted to stone this woman. This was, uh, normally, uh, this was an unusual method of execution, but that's not what it was meant for. The Lord had the Mosaic law to design to, for a safeguard of purity for the marriage. That's what it was about. But they wanted to take something and totally twist it around. But in verse 6 it says, we see Jesus. He didn't answer him. Here's where we go. And they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote in the ground as though he heard them not. And in his kindness, he didn't look at her at all. That's just like Jesus. Yeah. You know that? He knows she's there. And he didn't even give his accusers a, a, a second thought. Because he knows what's up their sleeve. Instead, he stooped down. And with that finger, he wrote in the ground. Mm, that's good, man. And he wrote, the accusers, they know what he wrote. That's all that mattered. I'm going somewhere with this. You know, heaven's available, but he hell is avoidable. Seven through nine. So they went and continued to ask him. They just berating him, berating him. Oh, yeah, like you're going to break him. You ain't going to break Jesus, man. It was three times. In verse six, seven. No, I'm sorry, 5, 6, and 7. They just constantly wouldn't shut up. But anyway, 7 through 9. And when so they continued asking him and lifted him up, and he, and he said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Jesus finished his writing, straightened up, looked that right at him, just like he will on the day of judgment. In Revelation chapter 20, he'll look at him straight in the eye. And he... And, his answer did not lower the standard of the law, nor did it allow his infinite love turn away from his sense of right and wrong. But now, the thing about it was, according to the Mosaic law, the stone had to be cast by a witness. Plus, they had to be free of that crime and that law. It says this in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 22, and Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10. I'm going somewhere with this. Just hang in there. Hang in there. I, got, I know I got a few seconds or a minute left to go. But I'm telling you, he, uh, was, he did not change the right or wrong of this. But what he's done was he turned it on them. He turned the onus on them. He turned it back on them. They said, you, and Jesus was saying, you can't prove it. Because they didn't bring the other guy. They weren't even interested. If you're going to commit adultery, it takes two. It takes two. They, didn't, they just brought her. It was such... When the people heard this, it was such a conviction that they started leaving out from the eldest and to the youngest. The eldest had the most sin, the youngest had the least. But it had such a conviction on it, the crowd left. What's that tell you? The crowd left. So in verse 10 and 11, when, when we go to this, verse 10 and 11, Jesus lifted up himself and said, none of these, none. And when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Jesus lifted up himself. And the woman, but I'm sorry, Jesus lifted up himself. And nobody but this woman were there. The accusers and crowd that they had done left. And the condemnation, but still yet the condemnation was still there. He had to deal, this lady had to deal with her condemnation. Her human accusers had vanished away, spurred by the guilty conscience of their own. But the true judge was still there. So he looked at her, and they looked at each other. All around was nothing. 
but no one else but Jesus could have emptied the temple and the courts because in John chapter 7 and verse, verse 46, never a man spake like this. Right, right. Never a man. Right. Who could have cleared all those people out? There's only two left. Then he forgave Jesus. Then he, then he forgave her. Jesus asked the question, Hath no man condemned thee? No man, Lord. That was the three words. No man, Lord. At any time, she could have got up and left. But there's something about when he talks, people listen. Because you had people leaving, you had people staying. That day, she gave her life to Jesus Christ. Jesus is a one-on-one. -on -one. He's one-on-one, -on -one, man. It's all good if you're in Jesus. Bless the Lord. I'm done. Second Peter chapter number 2, going to read one verse. Verse number 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now, with the Lord's help, I'm going to be happy when this one's over tonight. We're going to preach on the life of a defeated Christian. The life of a defeated Christian. Verse number 20 makes it very clear that the individuals they're talking about had received salvation from Jesus Christ. Look at the beginning of the verse. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world. How do you escape sin? Through the blood of Christ. Then it says they are again entangled therein. Well, after their escape, they became entangled. What they return to? The life that Jesus saved them out of. It says, and overcome. They were defeated. They weren't just entangled. They were entangled in something that was bigger than them. It says, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. The life of a defeated Christian, we're only going to talk about three of them. First one is dissatisfaction. This verse tells us that after they're saved, when they are defeated by the entanglements of the world, that the latter end, that means where they're at now, is worse than the beginning. Well, what were they before? Lost and on their way to hell. Right. That's hard to wrap your mind around that you can be saved on your way to heaven, but your current state is worse than when Jesus found you. Right. But that's what your Bible says. Right. So why is that the case? Well, the first is dissatisfaction. Nothing is able to satiate them. Right. They are stuck in a perpetual state of trying to find anything in the world to give them satisfaction, but their very soul is vexed in the fact that they know that they were once satisfied with the fountain of life, but they cannot be satisfied. No matter what they try, it's like a bottomless pit. Yeah, well, second one, they have a life full of distress. Now that word distress, okay, literally, it's a synonym for the word vexation. And if you, you all remember in Sunday school, that word vexation, according to Webster's 1828 dictionary, means literally to tear apart with hooks. The word vex means it feels like your life is being pulled apart and there's nothing you can do to keep it together. I mean, does it not say that they're entangled? They have many snares in them, and those snares are all pulling in different directions. Well, distress is a state of panic. They have no rock of ages because they left it. They have no anchor within the veil because they tried to detach themselves from it. They've taken all the security of God and they have forsaken it to return to a life without any of the blessings, without any of the benefits of God. Now you're starting to understand why it's worse than the latter. They didn't know how good they had it. Then they found out how good things used to be. When you were lost and in darkness and sin, you didn't know what you were, where you were, or where you were headed. But in order to be a defeated Christian, you have to look in the face your Lord Savior Jesus Christ and reject Him. But see, distress, that panic. We have a peace that passes all understanding, but can you imagine facing some of the things in your life if you didn't have it? The panic, the unknowing, the inability to find anything that can give you an answer. Yeah. See, when you have peace, you don't need the answer. You just need the Prince of Peace. Right. And everything's okay. Yeah. But then, third, the life of a defeated Christian, they are dejected. 
A dejected person sees no reason to get up out of the bed in the morning. A dejected person doesn't understand why going to the job and working to get a paycheck is even worth it anymore. A dejected person doesn't understand the importance of fellowship because they don't think they're going to get anything from it. A dejected person truly is fatalistic. You ever meet somebody that everything they say it's doom and gloom? It's because they're fatalists. They only see the worst possible outcome. But when you try to live a life that was birthed by Christ without Christ, all you're going to see is the worst. Because you know that there's no benefit, there's no gain, there's no way for you to reap better than you have sown. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Right? But also, a dejected person suffers from depression. Now, somebody that is currently medicated for clinical depression, what's that mean? What a way that I came out. At some point, chemicals up here are not the way they're supposed to be. But what happens if I get off that med? I'm depressed. And as a person that deals has dealt with that, I don't wish depression on anybody. It's a state where you see no light at the end of the tunnel. You have no hope. Your faith is very limited because you can't even muster up the energy to put feet on the floor, let alone to put trust into something. Well, imagine that every day, not because there was a reason for it, but because you've wandered into a place where all those benefits that you could, you forsook them. You left them at the Father's house. Didn't take them with you because you didn't want them. Well, the defeated were defeated. They became destitute and are in despair. They live in a defeated state, which according to this verse is worse than the state when they were damned to hell. And as the teens were up testifying on everything that they witnessed down there and how they were thanking them, and then we hear testimony from Brother Josh and Sister Brittany and Sister Sydney on how they've, you know, we've really let kids. How come they got to go to camp to find something that they should have been able to have access to here? Yeah, right, right. Could it possibly be because we got too many defeated Christians in the pews? Why do we need revival? You can only revive defeated and dead things. Revive us again. Why? Because the first revival wore off. Can you imagine a church that purposed just to live in victory in Jesus? One that understands all the things that God afforded to them, appreciates it, and then, but Josh, before the singing even kick off, we come in, no singing. People just get to worshiping God on how great God is. Don't that happen when you're defeated? won't happen when you it can't happen right. when you're defeated right. uh, in uh, Acts 13 verse 43 it says now when the congregation was broken up many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas who uh, speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God and I want to preach tonight on this simple fact. I'm going to stick with grace. And the reason I'm going to do that is because people say they believe that you're eternally saved, but the first time you mess up, they throw you away. That's not grace. First of all, I'm going to stay with grace because it's the foundation of of my salvation for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself is a gift of God I'm saved today not because anything I've ever done not because I deserve to be here not because I'm special not because of anything that I've accomplished in life it's simply the simple fact that God showed me personally his grace he showed me grace when I was ungodly he showed me grace when I wasn't deserving and matter of fact I'm not deserving today 
You know, I like grace simply because that pleases God. Yeah. You know, I mean, if, if God says as large of a person as God is, as intelligent as God, if he's satisfied with that, yeah. it's good with me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm satisfied with the fact that I don't have to do anything. Yeah. Amen. I'm satisfied with this thing, the foundation. You know, if you're building a building, and Brother Ray, you know, we brag on Brother Ray. He's a good builder. And there might be some of you. Uh, I hope that Brother Josh is. He's, he's doing it for a living. I hope he is. But if you get the foundation messed up, everything else is going to be messed up. That's why all these other religions are messed up. You know why? Because it's all based on works. No matter, no matter what it is, even in some of the so-called uh, Christian religions, they're based on works. Do good. Speak in tongues. Uh, uh, take a wafer. You'll be alright. Take a wafer and you'll do okay. No, I'm trying to tell you, you're not going to be okay until you run headlong into the grace of God. Now, I will say this, in Galatians chapter 1, we see the fight against God's grace. Uh, Paul said this, he said, I marvel that you are so soon removed uh, from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another, which is not another, but there be some of you that trouble you and pervert the gospel of Christ. You know what people have done since Adam and Eve? They fought the grace of God. You know what Adam and Eve did? They weren't content with God saying, don't partake in this fruit of this tree. You'll be all right. You know what they did after they sinned? They done just like we do. We run out behind the bush somewhere and make us an apron and we try to make a, a plea, appease our own conscience with doing some kind of good work. That's fighting against the grace of God. You'll be far better off if you'll just get down on your face before God and say, God, I need you. You know why you need a Savior? Because of the condition you're in. Uh, every time you sin, Brother Doug, you know what that does? That proves to us that we need a Savior. I needed a Savior when I was born. I'll need one when I die. I'm telling you today, there is a, a fight all across this world against the grace of God that's why they don't care what you say until you name one name Jesus you can say God they don't care because God could be this could be God this could be God this could be God that could be God but when you say Jesus that specifies the person who stood up and said I'm here for a reason I'm here to tell you you're a sinner and you'll need to get saved. And that's what the world don't like. There's a fight against this. You know, even people, you know, I, I said it earlier, people that say they believe in eternal security, I find very few that really believe it. And the reason I say that is because don't mess up. You know, I've heard this saying, first impressions are the most important. That's not true. Because I could, find, I could have seen you for the first time and you could have been the worst day of your life yeah. and that wouldn't, be the real, that wouldn't be who you really are. Uh, we're so easy to judge people and we don't even know who they are. We don't know what they're going through. I'm telling you, there's people all across this world going through troubles and trials and the first time they don't walk the chalk line that you think and I think they should do, we say they ain't nothing to them. You don't know what they're going through. That's why you're fighting against the God's grace. Every one of us that step on the golden street of glory, we'll step on there because of the grace of God. Uh, Titus 1, verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We see that fashioning of grace. You are what you are because God's made you that way. You, you know, the reason I'm here tonight, Brother Christian, it's not because I'm such a good fella. It's not because my wife made me. Amen. It ain't, she didn't make me come tonight. You know why I am what I am? I am because of His grace. God is out there molding on me every day. I get out by myself and God starts talking to me. He starts telling me, you know, this here ain't right, brother. You need to get straightened up. And if you're saved, He does the same thing to you. If God ain't fashioning you, you're lost as a golf ball in high weeds. Uh, fashioning 
God's molding. That's, he gives us a picture of that in the potter and the clay. The potter goes out into the world and he digs out clay and he plops it down on the potter's wheel and he puts it in his hands and he puts a little water on it for moisture and he starts spinning it. That's you on that wheel. That's me on that wheel. God is not done with us, my friend. He's fashioning every one of us. And until you lay your hands across your chest and you're dead, God ain't done. Amen. Fashioning. You know, listen, Ephesians 4, verse 7 says, But unto every one of us is given grace. That's grace is familiar. Uh, the older you get, you know what grace is? It's very familiar. Uh, I'm not familiar with your surroundings, but I am familiar with my surroundings. In other words, I could probably tell you where I was raised. You wouldn't know a thing about it. Right. Ain't familiar. Right. But I can name you every curve on the road that goes to my daddy's house. You know why? Because I lived there from the time I was five years old up until this present time. It's my, it was my home. I want to tell you, my friend, if you're saved by the grace of God, grace is familiar. Yeah. Every time you drop your head, every time you sin against God, you know what happens? Thank God for His grace. Thank God for His grace. Thank God. It's very familiar. It's a sweet old song. Uh, for By grace we're saved. I'm trying to tell you, my friend, grace is familiar to all of us. Listen to this. Psalm 17. The psalmist says, As for me, I will... Behold thy face in righteousness, and I shall be satisfied when I wake with thy likeness, the finalizing of grace. When we step off into the shores of glory, grace will be done with. We'll be in the reality of who Jesus is, what Jesus is. You know, we won't be guessing, Brother Ray, what heaven looks like. You know, we won't be thinking about what, what, what does clear streets of gold look like walls of jasper and gates of pearl what does this place look like what does Jesus look like grace will be over and it will become a very very realistic thing thank God for his grace Philippians chapter number 4 we'll begin reading in verse number 4 the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always and again, I say rejoice. Well, that ought to bring some conviction. And it also ought to bring some hope. It goes on to say, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Uh-oh. Again, that brings conviction. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving... Let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Uh, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. There's been a lot preached tonight about our standing before God. Now I assume most people in here have made a profession of faith. I hope everybody here tonight is saved. If you're not saved, tonight would be a good night to get saved. God loves you. He died for you. He allowed you to be here tonight to hear this preaching. He's been dealing with you about getting saved. Uh uh, uh, it's his will that none should perish but that all should come to repentance uh, uh, he wants to save you he said if any come to him he'd no wise cast them out uh, I, I promise you if you'll come to Jesus tonight he'll take you just as you are and he'll do a work in your heart and life uh, but I've listened to the preaching I've enjoyed every message mm, this is how the Lord wants to conclude this tonight I'm going to preach on true Christianity Everybody calls themselves a Christian in America. But you know, in the book of Acts, they were first called Christians, not at Jerusalem. At Antioch, 
And they were called Christians because their message and their walk and their life emulated the Lord Jesus Christ. It's one thing to call yourself a Christian. It's another thing to be one. So I want to just give you a couple things from these verses that are the marks of true Christianity. We find that Paul expounds that this mark of true Christianity can be found, first of all, in your attitude. Look at verse number 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, Listen, you have no reason to murmur murmur and complain. Uh, Be walking on your lower lip. Uh, Every one of us ought to be in hell tonight. Uh, Every one of us ought to be burning in the charred region of the damned. Uh, Hey, uh, 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 but if you've been saved, if you've been born again, if you've been washed in the blood of Jesus, uh, you're not going to hell. Uh, uh, Your name's recorded in heaven. Uh, Your citizenship is there. Uh, uh, Your conversation is there. Uh, Hey, your worst day in this world uh, is far better than any day in hell. Uh, And by the way, uh, 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 hey, this is as close to hell as we're ever going to get. Hey, the Lord is on the throne. Uh, Hey, his arm's not short to where he cannot save. Uh, His ear's not inclined to where he cannot hear. Uh, Hey, we got a darling Savior uh, who still reaches in his pocket uh, and dumps grace all over us. Uh, We ought to rejoice. Uh, We ought to be the happiest people in the world. Uh, Hey, we've got something to be joyful about tonight. Uh, Most people call themselves Christians look like a knot on a log. Can I say your attitude will never be higher than your attitude? Mm. You want to walk around in the in the uh, in the like lower than a snake's belly and walk around in the dregs of this world? Go ahead, but Jesus didn't save you for that. Uh the joy of the Lord's our strength. You know why we got so many defeated Christians? They don't have any strength. Uh, they put too much faith in CNN and Facebook, and I told you I like mentioning that. Uh, uh, all those things instead of putting their faith in the Lord, and the Bible says, so then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Hey, the doctors will tell you you are what you eat. You know, most people have diabetes because they have an affinity for sugar. Oh, some of them have some, uh, some health reasons because of their DNA, but most people don't eat right. That's why 70% of Americans are overweight. Hmm? Uh, we are what we eat. Uh, uh, Miss Sharon, if, she, if I had her stand up, I mean, she used to run marathons, and, and she, she eats all this healthy stuff and everything. She only weighs about 40 pounds, huh? You know, she ain't never ate the, the hind end of a cow. She's never done that. But Lord have mercy, you get some of us fat guys, we'll eat that all day long. We like it. But can I say, true Christians rejoice in all times because they're eating a steady diet from the Word of God. We see the attitude of a Christian. Can I say this? In these verses, we find the actions of a Christian. Mm -hmm. Look at verse number 5. It says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord's at hand. Be careful for nothing. That's what he said. Now, what does that mean? Well, moderation means it's a term for humility. Hmm? Let your moderation be known unto all men. How, how does the world look at you? Do they look at you as meek and lowly? Because that's how the Lord Jesus came. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He didn't make himself of any reputation, friend. And can I say true Christians? They're people of humility. Hmm? Can I say something else? It says, be careful for nothing. You know what that means? That means don't be anxious or worrisome for anything. Hmm? You see, uh, the Lord Jesus didn't fret about anything. Hmm? Uh, The Bible says he didn't have a pillow to to put his head upon. Didn't have a house. Didn't have much of this world's goods, but yet he owned it all. Maybe this will help you all fret and worry about everything. Do you realize you've been made a joint heir to the throne of Christ? Uh, You may not have much of this world's good, but neighbor, uh, when we step off into glory, we're going to own it all. Mm. Some of you fret and worry about everything. You know why? Because you're not walking with Jesus. Mm. When you give it all to Him and just walk with Him and commit yourself to His hand, you don't have anything to worry about. Did you ever see a little baby? 
Little baby don't worry about whether mom and dad's going to feed him, whether or not mom and dad's going to change him, whether or not mom and dad's going to be there and play with him. They, and the little baby just thinks that mom and dad are there for him or there for her. Hmm? I got news for you. Jesus is here for us. If you'd quit looking around and look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, it'd change your actions. Hmm? And we see true Christianity is marked by our attitude, by our actions. We also find that Paul deals with our asking. Look again in verse number 6. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, uh-oh, have you really talked to God about everything in your life? But in everything by prayer and supplication, here it is, with thanksgiving. Even for the thorns in your life, you ought to be thankful with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Most people, when they pray, they just got a shopping list they ask God for. God, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, and I want it now. Mm -mm. That's not praying. That's being selfish and a spoiled little brat. That's what that is. But oh, when your asking is about supplication and your request are about uh, things that bring glory to God and you thank God for what he's already supplied in your life. It'll be a good day in your life when you start coming to him and say, Lord, I'm not going to ask for a thing for myself. But Lord, could you touch sister so-and-so? Could you touch brother so-and-so? God, could you meet the need of this family? Could God, could you do this? And God, could you help these folks? And God, could you help? And God, I want to thank you in advance because you're a good God. And whatever you decide, it'll be right. And you start praying like that, God might uh, do work in your heart and in your prayer life. Amen. Can I say, Paul... And I don't have time to deal with verse number 7, but you know why you don't have the peace of God and the peace that passes all understanding? Because you're not doing these things. Hmm? You can't be a defeated Christian and have the peace of God. You don't have the peace of God because you've walked away from the peace of God. It's available to all. But if you want to walk down that road that leads to the hog pen, you're not going to have the peace of God. Hmm? But look, Paul deals with a Christian, and true Christianity deals with absorbing some things. Verse 8, I refer to it a lot. It's because God burned it in my heart. Look what it says. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. He says what you ought to put in your mind, what you ought to absorb are those things. Too many of us put trash in our mind. Uh, all you do is listen to a bunch of garbage. Garbage in, garbage out. That's why you live defeated. But if you start absorbing the goodness of God and the grace of God, you start thinking and meditating on God, uh, all of a sudden when you get up in the morning and you hear the birds singing, you realize they're singing praise unto God. Uh, you might break out in song yourself. Uh, uh, you get to thinking about uh, 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 everything that God has made. He made perfect in its own way uh, and start seeing the goodness of God in everything. It'll help you on down the road. Uh, all of a sudden you'll start appreciating the grace of God. You won't see folks' faults. You'll see that God loves them. God wants to do work in their life. And then I want you to notice the accountability. Talk about true Christianity. Here's where the rubber meets the road. Look at verse number 9. This is a pretty bold statement right here. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. That's pretty bold. Paul says those things that you've learned from my teaching and preaching, those things you've received from what I've had to say, those things you've heard me say, and those things you've seen me do, you do them. What's the result of that? And the God of peace shall be with you. Now here's my... Oh, meaning of this little thought. Could we truly exhort everybody around us to do what we've learned and what we've seen and what we've heard? We can tell them to, what they've learned and seen and heard in us. Do them. Would they live godly? Hmm. Hmm. Would God be pleased with them if they did those things? If not, 
It's because God's not pleased with us. If you're a true Christian, your life ought to tell everybody else, this is how you need to walk. If you're a true Christian, what comes out of your mouth ought to say to them, that's how I need to talk. If you're a true Christian, your attitude and outlook ought to tell them that ought to be my attitude and my outlook. I remember a time when folks uh, 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 that were lost would come to church because they'd seen something in somebody else's life uh, and said, I don't have that in my life, uh, and I want what they've got. Uh, uh, but isn't it amazing uh, uh, that a lot of young people are leaving churches because they've looked at mom and dad, and they've looked around the congregation, uh, and they've said, hey, what they got, I don't want. And it's not because it's got God on it. It's because they can't find God in it. It's a well-known fact. They have surveyed a lot of young people over the years. They've asked young people who's raised in church. I'm talking about fundamental Bible preaching churches. Why would you get out of church? They said, because after we'd leave church on Sunday, we'd go get something to eat, and I got tired of hearing Mom and Dad eat the preacher for lunch. Don't have any respect for that guy because my parents don't. Hmm? Got tired of mom and dad talking about sister so-and-so's dress being too short. Got tired of mom and dad at church singing, Oh, how I love Jesus, but at the house they live like hell on earth. Hmm? What they're saying is mom and dad weren't true Christians. A Christian in name only. And I remind you over there in Acts, they didn't call themselves Christians. They were called Christians. Now let me ask you something tonight. Are you a Christian? Does those verses describe you? Boy, it got real quiet in there. Now here's good news. God's got grace. 1 John 1, 9 is still in the book. If we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just, forgives and cleanses us of our sins. He wants you to have that kind of testimony. He'll develop that in you, but he won't do it against your will. You've got to want it more than you don't want it. You've got to want that new life that he testified about. You got to want the blessings of God in your life. Hmm? Now, listen. You can you can be a defeated Christian. You can you can lay in your bed uh, in the morning and, and and fret the day you was born and everything else. Talk about how bad you got it. I mean, you're only living in America. You only uh, had enough money to put five dollars a gallon gas in your in your pocket. Hey, uh, 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 Miss Nett and I was at a at a store the other day, and I mean, it was slam packed with people. I told her I said the economy's not too bad yet. I mean, people filling them buggies up with stuff. Uh, 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 listen, uh, uh, God's blessed you. Uh, 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 you may not have your cupboards full, but you had enough to eat today. Are you listening? Uh, I, God's blessed you with a good church to come to. Uh, uh, God's blessed you with the Bible. Do you realize uh, half the known world has not even heard the name of Jesus Christ? Uh, and you got the complete uh, Word of God. Uh, God's been good to you. Uh, and you can choose to live a defeated life if you want to. Uh, I'm going to choose uh, to live in the grace of God. Uh, hey, I'm going to choose uh, uh, to put God first. Uh, I'm going to long for God. Uh, I want to see how big a God He really is. Uh, I want to see if He can send revival again these days. Uh, I want to see if He can still reach uh, uh, to the gutter uh, and save to the uttermost. Uh, I want to see all that God's got for us. Uh, now you can live in your little state of depression and that's all in your mind, friend. Or you can let God move in and change your attitude. Hmm? And, and Christian was right, or Jordan, whoever said it, when these kids got to testifying this morning, Brother Josh said it, uh, 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 we, uh, uh, we should have kicked the walls out when them kids were singing tonight. You know why? Because our minds were on us and not on Him. Rejoice in the Lord evermore. And again, I say rejoice. True Christianity starts with that. And it finishes with others seeing you rejoicing and getting in on it. I want the peace of God in my life. And that comes 
by making God the Lord of my life. I wonder tonight, after all this good preaching, you ready to move up? You ready for something that's real? You ready to take the next step? See, you can't go all in until you take the next step. Why don't you take the next step and keep taking them until you're all in? Hmm? See, what scares us, Brother Josh, is we're afraid to jump all in. We're afraid the Lord won't catch us. Hmm? We'll just take that next step. And then take the next step. And then takes it, and all of a sudden, one, one of these steps, you're going to turn around and realize you're all in. Hmm? Huh? Uh, people say, well, if I go all in, God's going to want me to do this. God's going to want me. What's wrong with wanting to do something for God? Huh? It's the greatest privilege in the world that God would reach down into his, uh, his bag and pull, your, pull you out and want to use you to do anything. You ought to be in hell. But God wants to use you. What's wrong with wanting to be used of God? Huh? He wants to use you to impact somebody's life. That, the greatest thing to ever be said of you is you, God use you to help somebody. God wants to do that in some of your lives. Some of you, you participate in church. Some of you play church. Why don't you have church? God help us tonight. So let's all stand. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. So he comes, gets a song of invitation. God spoke to your heart. The altars are open. You ready to go take that next step? You ready to give the Lord your basket? Ready to say, Lord, here am I. Use me. You ready to let the grace of God really start fastening you for God's glory? Folks are coming. They're picking out a song. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for all these fellows who studied, got up and preached. Lord, the word of God will not return unto you void. God, I've got help from every one of their messages. God, I don't want to be a defeated Christian. I don't want to be fearful of the man in the world and not have a godly fear towards God. Lord, I want to bask in the grace of God. Thank you for grace. And God, I certainly, oh God, want to give you my basket. Lord, I don't have much to offer, but what I have is yours. Lord, I certainly... Oh, want to listen to the Master, even if everybody else leaves. And even, Lord, if what you have to say to me might cut my flesh, Lord, I still want to hang around where you are. And Lord, when you get done speaking, I just want to call you Lord. Because, Lord, you are the best thing that's ever happened to me. Now, God, speak in this invitation. There are folks that haven't had joy for a long time. Lord, there's folks they've drifted. Lord, there's folks that need to take that next step so they can go all in. God, just do a work in folks' hearts. And God, we certainly pray in a crowd this size if somebody's lost. God, we'd see the greatest work of grace. We'd see them get saved. God, I pray that you'd speak to hearts now. Bless now. Be with these folks that are in the altar. We'll bless you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.